And when you think about the climate we live in today, the social climate, there is a time to speak up, isn't there? And it's amazing that so many people keep silent when they should speak up or they speak up when they should keep silent. It says in verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate. Now, we don't hate each other, but we do hate the things that God hates. God hates sin. We can hate sin. There's a time for that. It says that there is a time of war. There is a time for that and a time of peace. When I read what Solomon wrote, I can't help but to think about David. The first thing we want to look at this morning, point one, write this down. This is important. Do what you should be doing. Do what you should be doing. If there was a time for war, David missed it. I mean, he got part of it right in part of his life, but in 2 Samuel chapter 11, he missed his opportunity. And if you don't do what you should do when you should be doing it, you're going to lose out. I, I think about this in terms, of, uh, in terms of exercise. If, uh, if you are young and you exercise when you're young and you continue to exercise, uh, chances are when you get older, you'll be in better shape and be able to exercise. But if you don't do what you should be doing when you should be doing it, if you don't exercise when you're young, it's going to make it virtually impossible when you're older. Now, I'm 39. I'm still really young. I'm really, really young. There's some of you who are 40 who are really old, but there's a, there's, it's all right. They say when you get over 40, you're in trouble if you don't exercise. That's what the 50-year-olds say. The 60-year-olds say you have to 50, and the 70-year-olds say you have to 60. But simply what I'm saying is if you don't do what you should be doing when you should be doing it, it's going to be harder. I think investing is this way. Saving, saving money. If you don't save money when you're young, if you don't invest money when you're young, you're going to miss out on years and years and years of what's called compound interest. Where in the latter years, the money that's made money is no longer really what's important. It's all the money that's made money. That's what's important. It's not the principle, it's the interest. And if you don't do what you should be doing, when you should be doing it, you're going to miss out on years of this compound interest. I think having children when you're younger is, is important. Because when you're 65, you don't get a chance to have children. Unless you're Sarah. And you can be as old as you want. And then if you don't train up those children, you miss out on great opportunities to fellowship when they're older. You see, when it comes to growth, you have to strike when the iron is hot. You all heard that, right? Strike when the iron is hot. Because, friends, if you start to strike cold iron, all that effort is for nothing. Here we see a, a, the destruction of a king who didn't do what he should have been doing when he should have been doing it. And when I think about growth in terms of spiritually, financially, just physically, in the church, in your home, in the government, if you do not do what you should be doing, you're going to miss out on years of blessing. And we could probably all say that, oh, I remember that when I was a kid, I, I, I had an opportunity to do this, but I didn't do this. And therefore, in the latter years, you say, I, I, I blew that opportunity. How many of you can say that? How many of you have blown opportunities? We've all blown them. So when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see this king. Here's what it says. Follow along with me if you would, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass... After the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, note that, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, David was a king. 
and he was a man of war. And at this time, when kings go forth to battle, he tarried in Jerusalem. In verse 2, and it came to pass in an, even t- in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And in verse 5, the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Here we have this king who shouldn't have even been where he was, struggling with what he was struggling with. And had this king been doing what kings should have been doing, he wouldn't have been here. Now, to be fair, David was a sinner. He was a sinner like you and I. And he was a man, in a sense, of like passions. And now maybe, if you say, maybe some of you say, well, I, I don't struggle with that, that exact thing. And I would, I would have to say, hey, wait a second. I mean, I think all of us on some level, the Bible says that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after with his eyes has committed adultery in his heart. You say, well, I've never committed adultery. Yeah, but if you've looked at somebody, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Right? For whosoever keepeth the whole law and yet offend at one point is guilty of all. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You can say, well, I, I've never murdered anybody. Like maybe David sent, sent uh, this, this woman's husband out and, uh, and, and murdered him. I never have done that. No, but you've hated your brother. And the Bible says that that's murder. But I think one of the things that David struggled with that I think we all struggle with from time to time is laziness. Not doing what we should be doing when we should be doing it. Like you say, well, I, I mean, I'm a pretty ambitious guy. You might say that. You might say, I'm a pretty ambitious girl. And, and, and really, I don't, I don't struggle with things of laziness. And, and really, I, when the morning, man, I hit the ground running. I'm always focused. I'm always disciplined. Yeah, maybe, maybe most of the time, some of the time. But I think for the most part, all of us struggle with a similar thing like David that sometimes it's just hard to get off the couch. And and there are times when we don't do the things that God has asked us to do. David should have been in battle. He shouldn't have been tearing in Jerusalem. He shouldn't have been just walking on his uh, his rooftop, looking looking around. He should have have, uh, had more resolve than that. But had he done what he should have been doing, he wouldn't even be in this situation. How many times have we been like David and forsaken our responsibility? How many times have we been like David and forsaken our responsibility? Maybe to, uh, maybe to, to train up our children. Maybe the couch just seems really cozy and comfy. And, and, and you sit in that couch and, and uh, you really just sit down and you really relax. And you know your kids are, are, are out of control and they need to be under control. And you just say, I'm tired. Or how many times at, uh, you need to be to work at 8 o'clock and about 7 o'clock, you're just rolling out of bed and you just, that snooze button is just getting worn out, you know? Do the things that you should be doing when you should be doing it. Christians, many times we drag our feet we drag our feet as opposed to dig them in, right? Let's dig in our feet. Let's, 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 let's get it done. Let's work hard. And we end up lazy. And because we're lazy, we are limited. I think there are a lot of Christians out there who think so much about themselves and so much about their own desires and their passions and, 
And uh, as opposed to David saying, there are my men are out there at war. And, and, and I should be out there with my men, with my sword, leading the charge. No, he sat back at home, didn't he? He became lazy. He didn't, he didn't deny himself. And can I say this this morning, that growth is about denying yourself. Growth is about denying yourself yourself. And, you know, we get whatever we want. We just, we just go out there, we, we, we buy it, we, we, we see it, we take it. It doesn't, doesn't matter. We, just, we don't deny ourselves ourselves enough, do we? Growth is about denying your selfish tendencies. Growth is not about I want, but it's about I must. I must do what I should be doing. And at times, even when you don't want to do it, that's the amazing thing about growth. If you want to grow, it's about denying yourself, yourself, your lazy self, and saying, I might be lazy, but I'm going to get up, and I'm going to charge ahead, and I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to have a good family, and I'm going to have a good church, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to be kind to people. Because laziness is kind of, infectious. And the older you get, I think the easier it gets to be lazy because I think that you think you earned it. And when you get to be 70 and 80 and 90, oh, I don't have to work anymore. Do you think that's what God's plan is for your life? Do you think God's plan is when you've gotten to the ripe old age of 90 years old that you don't have to work anymore? Because I'm telling you, friends, that there's no verse in the Bible that says, well, there's There's a time to be lazy. Laziness isn't spiritual. Is there a time to rest? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a time to rest. But never, ever a time to be lazy. Growth is about denying yourself yourself. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23... Jesus said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If any of one of you is going to go after God, if you are going to be a disciple, let you deny yourself. You can't give in to all of our whimsical desires. Oh, I really want this and I really want that. The Lord says, put that all behind That's not what's important. It's what I want. That's what God says. This was the turning point in David's life. When you look at when his life actually flipped, this was it. It was when he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. And he lost big on this. And because he didn't do what he should have done when he should have been doing it, he didn't do what he could have done when he could have been doing it. 2 Samuel 12, 10 through 11 says this, Now therefore, the prophet speaking, Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. He sent a man out to die. Why did he send a man out to die? He's trying to cover his tracks. He's trying, to, he's trying to make a, a, a wrong right by doing the wrong thing. And see, there's a whole message in here, too, that, that oftentimes we just dig ourselves deeper, deeper, deeper into the hole. <laughs> and that's what was happening here. It says, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will rise, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. Can you imagine? David, you blew it so bad that I'm going to have, give you so many problems within your own house. It was the turning point for him. So the first thing is we have to know we need to do what we should be doing. Do what you should be doing when you should be doing it. And secondly, write this down, or you won't be able to do what you could be doing. Because sin affects your choices. 
The, the, the more you sin, the less choice you have. The more you do wrong, the more, the more you engage in things that you shouldn't be doing, the less, the less options that you have. You see, sin can keep us from choosing the things you want to choose. Sin keeps you from choosing those things. You know, the boys and I, we have a, we have a lot of conversations about, about money. And uh, they're super hard workers, and I enjoy, I enjoy watching them pile up money. And, uh, and it's really, really neat. One day, yes, this last week, we, we had this conversation. And, uh, and I said to them, now, they've, they've, got, they've got money, so they've got some money to spend. But they have this thing, and, and I think that all of kids have this. I had this. I still have this, <laughs> where money just burns a hole in your pocket. You just got to spend it. You know, there's just something about putting it in your pocket. That's why I just leave it on my dresser, because it can't burn a hole through my dresser. It's just through my pocket, you know. So, like, like every kid, they just, they, they, there's, there's money, and I want to spend it. And so they were trying to decide, should I go to Walmart or should we go to Quick Star? Should I buy Legos? Should, should I buy this or that? You, you ever have those, those, those choices to make? Where it just gets, you have, you, have, you have so much money, you're just like, I don't even know what to spend it on. And, and that's the nice thing about being kids and making money is they just have so much they don't have to spend it on. And so they're trying to make this decision, this choice. Like, what should I spend it on? And so we had this talk, and I said, now listen, guys. I said, as soon as you spend that money, it's gone. And you have to, you have to earn it again. As soon as you spend that, you, you, you can't choose between whether you want Legos or you, you want to buy Matchbox cars or you want to buy a bike or a smelting. They want to buy a smelting pot, smelt down their copper, make little copper bars. And I said, well, that's, that's great, but then the copper is not worth anything because it's, you can't identify it, so you can't even scrap that. They like to scrap copper. So I said, you can't even do that. So, I mean, as soon as the money has gone, it's gone. You, 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 you essentially eliminate your choices. And I said, now, the reason you're struggling right now is because you have so many choices. You have what we call options. I said, the more money that you have, the more options you have. The people that don't have money have less options. And the people that have money have more options. What should I do with this money? I've got money here, and I've got money there, and I could spend it here, and I could spend it here. And I said, as soon as it's gone, your options are gone. I said, sin is kind of like this, isn't it? When you sin like David sinned, when he didn't do what he should have been doing, he, he, he chose to exercise a level of freedom. He spent his options. He didn't have any more options to do what he could have done in the future. And because of this, his life is essentially ruined. I mean, here's a guy who lost the joy of his salvation. He didn't even have that. His son died. There was problems in his, in, in his family, and it was just chaotic. I mean, he spent his choice. He spent his choice on doing the wrong thing. And when we get to uh, 2 Samuel 21, here's a guy who, in the beginning, in chapter 11, he, he, he should have gone to war with his servants. And then he's basically kicked off the battlefield when he wants to war. So listen to this in 2 Samuel 21. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him, and he fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. <laughs> Maybe he didn't exercise when he was young. I don't know. And jump down to verse 17. But Abijah, the son of Zariah, Succored him and, and smote the Philistines and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, David. Can you imagine this great man of war, this, this wonderful conqueror? He says at the end of verse 17, That thou quench not the light of Israel. Listen, David, you're screwing this thing up. When you should have been out to battle, and you weren't, you failed. And now I'm going to kick you off the battlefield. You just, just go. Go. You don't good to us anymore. Lest you quench the light of Israel. David's sin affected his victory that Israel had over the enemies. Do you know why? Because David didn't do what he should have been doing when he should have been doing it. 
And because he didn't, then he couldn't do what he wanted to do. You see, I think this is an important point that we make sure we're doing the the right thing, even when it doesn't seem all that important. And we have choices. We have choices. Should we or shouldn't we? Should we be faithful in the little things? And, and, And it seemed maybe like a little thing. David had conquered. I mean, he was a winner. I mean, Goliath, that was just the first step. I mean, this guy, he, he, was, he was brutal, man. He won. And so then he kind of eases off the throttle a little bit, and he says, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy my life, and, and I'm not going to do the things I should be doing. There's no need to grow because I have no place to go. I've already got the palace. I've already got all the stuff that I need, and you know what? I'm going I'm to sit back. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Had he had been faithful when he should have been faithful, had he had worked the way he should have worked and been the man of God that he should have been, this wouldn't even happen. In Luke 16.10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much, and be faithful even when it doesn't seem important. Even when you say, this is the smallest of things. This just doesn't even seem all that important. Well, I mean, what's an extra, what's an extra dollar anyway? I'll, I'll spend an extra dollar. I'll spend an extra $20 or an extra $1,000. It doesn't matter. But you're going to miss years of compound. You know what the years of compound really look like? If you just do what you should be doing when you should be doing it, you'll have years of splendor. I I encourage the kids to work hard. Work hard, save, save, work hard, save, work hard, save. Because you can work hard and not save and get you nowhere, and then you can save and not work hard and get nowhere. It's a combination. Work hard, save your money. Right? Right? You're going to miss the years of company. So we have this, I, I, I floated an idea to Ben the other day, Ben and Josh. I said, what? so he's going to turn 15 in uh, this year. <laughs> in, in, uh, soon, I think. And so October, October 21st. He's going to turn 15 October 21st. And I said, what do you think about this idea? I said, what do you think about 50 by 15? So between the boys, they got tens of thousands of dollars saved. And I said, what about 50,000 50, by 15? Is it possible? Let's, let's work them. Let's work them till their hands are blistered. Actually, we've been doing that, so <laughs> i got to think of something else that's, more, more, that's harder than that. I said, what do you think about that? Do you know what, you know what working hard at 14 and 15-year-old, 15 15-year-old, you know what that looks like? In 50 years, if you never added a penny to $50,000 when they're 15 years old, and let it compound for the next 50 years by the time we're 65 at 10% return, it's $5.9 million. They'd be fine in retirement if they just put the money in and just said, Dad, I'm just, I'm going to be a bum the rest of my life. Now, that is not going to happen in my home. <laughs> and you all know that. If they would work hard when they should work hard and invest when they should invest, if you exercise when you can exercise, if you, if you study the scripture to show yourself approved, you're not going to be embarrassed when somebody says, where's that verse at? And you're like, I don't know. Whatsoever the hand finds to do, do it with all they might. Because there's going to come a time when you, when you can't work. And here's the problem, friends, is when it comes to growth, we minimize things. We minimize habits of exercise. I, I, I know that I do, and I shouldn't, and that's an area that I'm working on. We minimize the habits of daily Bible reading. We minimize the habits of daily prayer with our God. We minimize, we minimize and minimize, and then we end up 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and say, if I would have just done what I should have done back then, Hindsight is always 2020. 
And any of you that say, well, I've never been affected by that, you're probably lying. Because there are times when I look back almost every day and my wife says, honey, you can't live in the past. <laughs> and I say, no, but I'm going to learn from it because I'm not going to repeat it. Learn now. Grow now. There is a time of war. And in this case, David, had he had done what he should have, should have been doing, had he had been out to battle, his house probably would have been fine. He would have continued this flawless reign. He wouldn't have lost the joy of his salvation. His son died because of his sin. Now, it's amazing to me that this year particularly, we have this theme of growth 2020, and yet at the same time, like the world is just coming unglued, right? And so I want to just be an encouragement to you today. That though everything else around us is falling apart, we can keep putting things back together. And, and we can make some, some new habits, some new patterns. We can work hard. Don't, don't just throw in the towel and say, well, it's a pandemic. Well, I'm 90 years old. Or I'm just 13 years old. Or I'm just not capable of. But friends, that's not a winning attitude at all. That attitude is not going to get you to where you want to be. The attitude we should have is one of resolve saying, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win at my marriage. I'm going to win with my kids. I'm going to win with my finances. And I am certainly going to win spiritually. I am going to win spiritually. And if you do what you should be doing, when you should be doing it, you will be able to do the things that you could be doing. Friends, we can live our whole life with regret. And I look at David and I say, There's, here's a guy right here who regretted. There was a lot of regret in David's life. And you can just imagine if he would have just said, hey, you know what? I'm a man of war and I should be out there being a warrior. And my people need me. And I need to be out there with my sword. And I need to be out there helping my people. All of this regret would have been nothing. You have to ask yourself, is a life of sin, is your sin really worth it? Is your sin really worth it? Is laziness worth it? Is it... it, it all the money that we spend on nothing, on frivolous things, is it worth it? Because that $50,000 is worth $5.9 in 50 years. So you have to ask yourself, is that $100 whatever, is that worth $200,000? Because it's not really a, worth $100. It's worth what the compound would give you. It, it, is the struggle of having children that are wayward and, and, and frustrating to you, is that worth it? Is, is it worth it having a bad marriage sitting on a couch saying, well, whatever, my husband is just brutal? Or is it worth it getting up and saying, hey, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do what I should be doing. Because that's what makes the difference. And I think that's what makes the difference in growth. Friends, sin is pleasurable for a season, but it's only for a season. And then, there's, and then there's regret. And then there's disappointment and discouragement, just like David, who even loses the joy of his salvation. That's how much he regretted it. In conclusion, let me say this. If God has given you the ability, don't forsake the opportunity God made David a man of war. And in Psalm 144, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war. You see, David learned how to be a man of war from God. If God has given you the ability, don't sit around and say, you know what, I'm just going to be lazy on this one. God blessed David, but David lost out when he was lazy. 
Friends, if you want to grow this year, if you want to be somebody different, I say this all the time, when you leave this place, I want you to be somebody different than when you came in. I want the word of God to dwell in you richly with all wisdom. I want you to be enlightened by the word of God as the Holy Spirit moves in your life and you say, hey, I can learn from this. I don't have to be the same person. I think we all struggle with laziness and now it's time to get up off our couch. It's time to, it's time to step away from Facebook for just a moment, right? It's time to step away from, from the things, the besetting sin, right? The sin that, that does so easily beset us. It's time to get away from the weight. Maybe they're not sins. There's no sin necessarily in Facebook. Maybe it's weighing us down. It's keeping us from running a race. Maybe it's time to put some of these things aside and say, I am going to do better. I'm going to grow this year. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better woman. I'm going to be a better kid, better grandma, better grandpa, whatever it is. I'm going to be a better employer, a better employee. I am going to win. And win at life. Had David just had done, had he just done what he was supposed to be doing? When that opportunity presented himself, he would just be working hard, saying, I'm going to go to battle because that's what God's called me to do. He wouldn't have had this problem. He might have had other problems, but not that one. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't miss the opportunity to trust in him. Because you literally could walk out of this building, get in your car, pull out onto Division Street, and get hit by a beer truck. And your life could be over that fast. Don't miss the opportunity. And maybe you know people in your life who have died without trusting Christ as their Savior because they didn't take the opportunity to trust him when they were still alive. Or maybe you didn't take the opportunity to share Christ with them while they were still alive, and you missed the opportunity to lead them to heaven. Don't miss the opportunity. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior today, I encourage you to trust in him. Believe in Jesus Christ. That he, believe that he died for your sin. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. The sin keeps us away from God. This sin will keep us from heaven if it's not paid for. We have to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. I want this hand to represent the Lord Jesus. He died on the cross to make the payment for our sin. Friends, salvation is not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done. He died on the cross for your sin because the wages of sin is death. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that today.